Good evening. Happy Friday. It looks like all the votes are in. Uh, yes has it. It looks like Saturday is the date it's going to be. So there will be a debate tomorrow at 4 p.m. Be there or be square or don't be there. That's fine too. Uh, Teresa won't be there. Um, apparently I'm just going to be debating retards. Um, so, okay. Uh, she will be, she did invite me for for total complete disclosure, she did invite me to her Discord for a panel on Sunday. She's going to have a panel. And I, number one, wouldn't debate somebody on a panel because then it would be, I don't know, two, three, four, to four against one. And that's not, that's not something that I'm willing to deal with. Um, it just, I just don't care enough to. And I also am not going to leave my Discord server for somebody else's. Just not going to do it. So uh, good luck to you, Teresa. Um, I hope, I hope you, uh, you accomplish something with your panel. I hope you find some truth. Uh, the arguments that Teresa made, though, she has switched up from her previous case, which was the school board of Nassau County versus Arlene. Uh, which was a uh, oh, yeah. Handicap Rehabilitation Act, I believe. And uh, now she has settled on Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, she doesn't quite have my argument right. I believe I wasn't really uh, responding very fully to her. She said, so the government only needs reasonable grounds to support the belief a person is infected with a contagion to isolate them. Uh, I believe it's infected and contagious. Uh, infected and infectious is, is how I'll try to uh, refer to it. Um, so when I said that appears to be the case, I must have not read it very closely. It's infected and infectious. Um, and then she thinks that they would need to prove more. Um, I think they'd have to prove more the, than that you were infected or probably infected. Uh, and that is a, a correct statement. They have to prove you're infected and infectious. Um, if you're just infected, but you're not infectious, there's no reason for them to quarantine you uh, because you're not going to infect somebody else. But if you are infected and infectious, then that's, that's when they would isolate you and quarantine you and all that other fun stuff. And she says, and the government can't just come in and quarantine people simply because they're infected with the disease, which is your claim. And again, it's infected and infectious. Uh, so anyway, so this is, uh, this is the case that I cited. Now, I cited Henry Martin for the simple proposition uh, that, there, that there is very clear uh, federal uh, case law on the subject, uh, Gibbons v. Ogden, and um, oh gosh, what is it? Uh, Compagnie Francaise du Navigation du Vapor, or something like that, versus the uh, Board of Health of Louisiana. Uh, very clear that unless there is direct federal law on the subject, then states control quarantines. So I was looking at Martin for the purpose of, since there is, in my estimation, no state law, or excuse me, no federal law directly in control. I looked at state law, and I only looked at one state. I looked at California. Every state's going to be different. So, uh, But what California found was that the real issues in the present case, stripped of, of surrounding circumstances, immaterial to such issues. So ignoring all the immaterial things and simply stated, the real issues are whether or not there was reasonable cause. As I've said before, that's basically the equivalent of probable cause, um, except this is a civil matter instead of a criminal matter. So the real issues are whether or not there was reasonable cause for the health officer to believe that these Petitioners were infected with a venereal disease in an infectious stage at the time the quarantine order was issued. And if so, whether such, so that's step one. When they were quarantined, 
Was there reasonable cause to believe they were infected and infectious? And if so, whether such reasonable cause continued to exist to the time of the hearing. Because if they were no longer infected and or infectious, then when they get to the hearing, they need to be released. So the the due process, the minimum constitutional concerns for the state, the state has to prove, the state bears the burden of proof, the state has to prove that there is reasonable cause to believe that the person being quarantined is infected and infectious. That's the minimum. Of course, and again, I understand Teresa disagrees with this, but we're going to get to her argument. So her argument is that uh, Title II of the ADA controls. And this is the one of the, um, this is the enforcement or the discrimination portion of 42 USC for the uh, Title II. And there's also the CFR, the Department of Justice has a code of federal regulations where they incorporate the statute and some basically clarifying material around it. We'll look at both. To establish a violation of Title II, plaintiff must show, number one, that he's a qualified individual with a disability. And qualified individual with disability does have a definition. It's a specific definition. Um, disability even has a definition. But I will concede for the point of this, there, there is no doubt that a, that a uh, disease is a disability. If if you're being discriminated against based on having HIV, you're being discriminated against on the basis of having a disability. That is that is the, the sum of the law. I, I actually can look it up. Oh, here it is, right here. Uh, so functions of the immune system, uh, something that impairs the functions of the immune system, like HIV, or infects your respiratory, circulatory, endocrine, blah, blah, blah. So like... I guess, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm tired, so I get distracted. Uh, but yeah, a, a disease like HIV is going to qualify as a disability. Uh, number two, that he was either excluded from participation in or denied the benefits of some public entity's services, programs, or activities, or was otherwise discriminated against by the public entity. Well, you're going to have to really wonder at that point, is a quarantine a service program or activities you're going to say well it's or otherwise discriminated against by the public entity but we'll get to that because it all comes down to the qualified individual with a disability definition and that to and that such exclusion denial of benefits or discrimination was by reason of the plaintiff's disability so one thing that you really should be aware of is that the the burden shifts in the case of the constitutional question, in the case of Henry Martin, uh, this was a writ of habeas corpus, the burden was on the state. The state had to prove, the state had the burden of proof to show that the petitioners were, by reasonable cause, infected and infectious. That's the level of proof. Basically, it's a probable cause burden of proof, very low. Um, probable cause is the same amount of proof it takes to arrest somebody. It's a very low burden of proof. But once you get into Title II of the ADA, the plaintiff bears the burden of proof, and that's by preponderance of the evidence, if I'm not mistaken, which is a higher burden of proof. It's not as high as, as clear and convincing or uh, beyond a reasonable doubt, but it is certainly quite a bit higher than probable cause. So, Right there, I mean, if I really wanted to be nitpicky, right there, I could say that she's wrong, that they would need to prove more because the state still, even under Title II of the ADA, the, the state doesn't bear the burden of proof. It's the plaintiff who bears the burden of proof. The government can't just come in and quarantine people simply because they're infected with the disease. They can, provided they have the reasonable cause burden of proof, at least in California, and maybe elsewhere, as we'll see. Uh, but that would be a nitpicky argument, and I don't want to be con I don't want to be um, accused of being nitpicky on this. This is this is 
the real deal here. I mean, we're going to get into it. All right, so let's see. Let's get out of here. Uh, we're going to go into... Oh, oh, good Lord. I'm getting lost already. And it is... No, it is this one. And it is this one right here. And it is this one right here. So this is uh, this is what Teresa is resting her argument on. And just, just so we remember, Title II of the Act. Title II of the Act isn't big. Let's just go over it real quick uh, so you can see it. There's definitions, discrimination, enforcement, and regulations. So definitions, it defines public entity. It defines qualified individual with a disability. We'll get to that. Uh, but this is, this is what she read or what somebody found that skimmed through it and gave her the answer, which is what I really believe was happening because she was too busy typing to have been looking it up. Uh, it says, subject to the provisions of the subchapter, no qualified individual with a disability shall, by reason of such disability, be excluded from participation in or be denied the benefits of the services, programs, or activities of a public entity or be subjected to discrimination by any such entity. Sounds great, right? But again, we have these programs, uh, services, programs, or activities is quarantine a service program or activity? Now she's going to say, oh, wait, but it's or subjected to discrimination by any such entity. And, you know, that's a good argument. That's a really good argument. Uh, but it's no qualified individual with a disability shall be subjected to. So what is a qualified individual with a disability? A qualified individual with a disability means an individual with a disability who with or without reasonable modifications to rules, policies, or practices, the removal of architecture, communication, or transportation barriers, or the provision of auxiliary aids and services, meets the essential eligibility requirements for the receipt of services or participation in programs or activities provided by a public entity. The essential eligibility requirements. Uh, now, that would be having a disease for a quarantine or, or, a, or an isolation. Uh, for the receipt of services or participation programs or activities is being isolated or quarantined participated in program or activity i don't think it is there's no solid case law on this so we're going to have to leave it to your best judgment but wait there's more i have no idea where i am on this this is the uh, department of justice this is 28 CFR part 35. This is straight from ADA.gov regs. This is this is from their webpage. This is the this is the most current. I could do it from uh, from Cornell as well, um, but uh, we. Could, I don't. I don't want to lose my place. Let's do Title 42 check, and this is not right. So we want to do this. Just want to show you that I'm not screwing around. And it is Title 28, I believe. And wait. 28, Part 35. Next. Uh, well, I have no idea where it is in here. Let's see. It's 7D, I think. Oh, here we go, part 35. Hey. Uh, definition of disability, there we go. Hmm. All right, anyway, I'm gonna do it on here because I've got them all on one page and I could just click back and forth to them. But you see I have two, uh, two things clicked. Uh, it's going to be th uh, 28 CFR 35.130, General Prohibition Against Discrimination. And we're going to go down to here. And a public entity shall make reasonable modifications in policies, practices, or procedures when the modifications are necessary to avoid discrimination on the basis of disability. Unless the public entity can demonstrate that making the modifications would fundamentally alter the nature of the service, program, or activity. Now, I want to go back to Teresa's argument. The government can't just come in and quarantine people simply because they're infected with the, dis with the disease. If they're infected and infectious, that is precisely what a quarantine is for. 
That's why they have quarantines. That's why quarantines exist. If you can't discriminate against people with disease by placing them in a quarantine, then you can't have quarantines. But we can have quarantines. We do have quarantines. Quarantines are in effect all the time all around us. I believe Hawaii has a 14-day quarantine for people coming into Hawaii right now due to coronavirus. Um, prisons are are usually where you see um, where you see people uh, complain about quarantines because prisons they they pass around a lot of diseases really fast because they're tight places with people who don't always have the best hygiene and you know they can't get away from each other and self isolate and they don't they don't always have the options to wash hands and and do all the other things that people would do I guess I've never been in prison but diseases run amok in there. And so you see a lot of litigation from prisoners about being quarantined. Uh, normally, it's it's uh, writs of habeas corpus. Sometimes it is ADA claims, but it's not ADA saying that the, that the quarantine itself is a violation. It's, it's denying them access to other services because of the quarantine is usually what their grievance is. But it's, it's not a very logical position to say that you can't quarantine people simply because they have a disease, they're infected and infectious. That's literally the purpose of a quarantine. And if the government made modifications to the quarantine, the only, the only thing they'd make, like, okay, so you're not in quarantine anymore, well, then that is going to alter fundamentally alter the nature of the quarantine. Now, again, I'm not convinced that quarantine is a service program or activity, but, you know, your mileage may vary. Uh, the other big one that I think would come into play is direct threat. And direct threat, uh, this part does not require a public entity to permit an individual to participate in or benefit from the services, programs, or activities of that public entity when that individual poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others. Just so you know, uh, let's see. And, and I want general requirements, direct threat. This is, this is, the, uh, this is what it's talking about. This is the 139. And enforcement, where is it? Is it regulations? I don't remember where I was going with that. I'm tired. I Like I said, I was up since 3.30 this morning, so I'm a little tired. But I was going somewhere with it. Anyway, my point is direct threat. Uh, so direct threat in determining whether an individual poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others, a public entity must make an individualized assessment based on the reasonable judgment that relies on current medical knowledge or the best available objective evidence uh, to ascertain the nature, duration, or severity of the risk, the probability that the potential injury will actually occur, and whether reasonable modifications of policies, practices, or procedures or the provision of auxiliary aids or services will mitigate the risk. Now, I'm not entirely sure that either one or both would work. Uh, the bulk of my, of my argument is I, I do think that both of these uh, two sections uh, poke a hole in, in Teresa's claim that the ADA covers it. Um, it is... that part right there and the direct threat part uh, they do it does poke holes now there's no litigation directly on this issue that I could find but there are things that, that really strongly make me believe besides the lack of litigation on it there are things that strongly make me believe that um, the ADA is the wrong tree to bark up uh, and this is one of them this is a federal CFR, 42 CFR, 70.6. Uh, I believe it's the uh, Department of Health and Human Services makes this one, or the CDC does. 
Anyway, the director, I believe that's of the CDC. Yeah, director of the CDC. May authorize the apprehension, medical examination, quarantine, isolation, or conditional release of any individual for the purpose of preventing the introduction, transmission, and spread of quarantinable, communicable diseases as defined by executive order based upon a finding that, number one, the individual is reasonably believed to be infected. That sounds very similar to that, doesn't it? With a quarantinable communicable disease in a qualifying stage and is moving or about to move from a state into another state or the individual is reasonably believed to be infected with a quarantinable communicable disease in a qualifying stage and constitutes a probable source of infection to other individuals who may be moving from a state to another state. So if, you're, if you are infected and infectious, and moving to another state, or if you're infected and infectious, and you are a probable source of infection to other people who are moving from state to state, then the CDC has the authorization to apprehend, quarantine, and isolate you on the basis of you having a communicable disease. Now, the, uh, the communicable diseases for this are defined by executive order, the president determines what they are. And no, HIV is not one of them. But it doesn't mean that it couldn't be. Finally, uh, there's this. I found this today. Uh, this is a Congressional Research Service Report, CRS, Congressional Research Service Report for Congress. Uh, these are, these are done by people who work in the Library of Congress, by attorneys. She's an attorney. Um, I'm not sure if she wrote this by herself, but she's an attorney. And she did this research. Now, normally I, I wouldn't just cite to some other attorney's outline. And I'm not, I don't, I don't really hold this. This isn't. This isn't something that I would find particularly um, persuasive, but I know a lot of people would find this persuasive. That's why I'm throwing this out there. But in this, uh, she goes through uh, various legal challenges, legal challenges to state quarantine authority. There's Gibbons v. Ogden. We talked about that. There's Compagnie Française de Navigation à Vapeur v. Louisiana State Board of Health. Uh, both of them said that the uh, state quarantines are valid exercises of a state's police power. Uh, courts have recognized an individual's right to challenge his or her isolation by petitioning for a writ of habeas corpus. Well, the primary function of a writ of habeas corpus is to test the legality of the detention Prisoners often seek a declaration that a statute under which they were quarantined is unconstitutional or violative of due process. Due process is a concern, though courts are reluctant to interfere with the state's exercise of police powers with regards to public health matters, except where the regulations adopted for the protection of the public health are arbitrary, oppressive, and unreasonable. And that's citing to uh, People X. Rel. Barmore v. Robinson, which is... I believe, an Illinois state statute. Uh, it is from 1922. Most of these cases are older. So that doesn't mean they're, that doesn't mean that they have less power or less authority or hold less sway until there is a newer case that says otherwise they are the law of the land. So, you know, you got to deal with that. Like Marbury versus Madison was like uh, 1800. Gosh, golly. 1804 or something like that. I mean, it was like right at the turn of the of the century. But it's still like one of the first cases you learn in law school. The court the courts appear to give deference to the determinations of state boards of health and generally uphold such detentions as valid exercises 
of a state's duty to preserve the public health and not violate of due process. However, some courts have refused to uphold the quarantine of an individual where the state is unable to meet its burden of proof concerning that individual's potential dangers to others. So this state right here says that you have to meet a burden of proof showing a potential danger to others. And that's State v. Snow, Arkansas. Now, California says you have to show infected and infectious. Arkansas, you have to meet a burden of proof concerning a potential danger to others. Those are differences between the states. Those, you know, you got to remember the Constitution sets the floor. States can raise that bar, but they don't have to, but they can. In People X. Rel. Barmore v. Robertson, the court refused to grant a petition for rid of habeas corpus of a woman who ran a boarding house where a person infected with typhoid fever had boarded. The woman was not herself infected with the disease, disease, but she was a carrier and had been quarantined in her home. She argued that her quarantine was unwarranted because she was not actually sick, though the court noted that it was not necessary that one be actually sick as that term is usually applied, in order that the health authorities have the right to restrain his liberties by quarantine regulations. Uh, this is Illinois, so, you know, your state may vary. In providing justification for quarantine under these circumstances, the court explained that since disease germs are carried by human beings, and as the purpose of an effective quarantine is to prevent the spread of the disease to those who are not infected, anyone who carries the germs must be isolated. The court found that in the case of a person infected with typhoid fever, anyone who would come into contact with that person must be isolated in order to prevent the spread of the disease to others. Now, I'm sure that there are people out there who are just railing at the court misusing the word isolated. Uh, they mean quarantined. Well, again, these are courts. These aren't doctors, and they're going to they're gonna use this, this language somewhat loosely. The Florida Supreme Court upheld a quarantine statute that was challenged on due process grounds denying the petitioner's petition for writ of habeas corpus. In Moore v. Draper, the court stated that the constitutional guarantees of life, liberty, and property of which a person cannot be deprived without due process of law do not limit the exercise of the police power of the state to preserve the public health so long as the power is reasonably and fairly exercised and not abused. In addition to the due process claim, the petitioner had challenged the statute as discriminatory against all persons other than those of a certain religious faith and belief. The court rejected both arguments, finding the statute was a proper exercise of state's police power, not violative of the petitioner's constitutional rights. So I'm going to leave it there. I do want to note that in this brief right here, Federal and State Isolation and Quarantine Authority, there was not one single mention of Jacobson versus Massachusetts. <laughs> a subtle dig at blue bacon. <laughs> anyway, uh, so that's my argument. Um, uh, I'm sure that uh, Teresa and her panel will probably discuss it. And their crack legal researchers will no doubt come up with some crack legal reasons why uh, governments can't just come in and quarantine people simply because they're infected and infectious. And I can't wait to hear all about it. Thanks for watching. Have a great evening and I hope to see you on Saturday. Bring your best bring your best debating shoes. Have a good night.